Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and today I'm going to be doing a watercolor tutorial on how to paint these snow covered evergreen trees. Here is the reference photo that we will be working off of for this painting. And then here is a rough drawing guide. So you can use this as just a guide to help break down the shapes or you can screenshot it, print it out and use it to trace your image. So here I have the image drawn onto my watercolor paper. And now I have something called a wax resist stick. So it is kind of like a wax crayon, but it has no pigment in it. And I am going to just apply that very lightly to all the areas that I want to stay perfectly white. If you don't have um, a wax resist stick, you can also use masking fluid. Um, masking fluid is a little more expensive, um, but you do have a little bit more control and you can remove it when you're done. Or if you don't like where you put it, you can remove it. The wax resist, resist sticks are a little bit more affordable. Um, they're less messy. You don't have drying time with them, but once you apply that wax, you aren't getting it off your paper. So just something to keep in mind when you're choosing what method. I personally like this method for beginners, um, people on a budget, or just to try new things and kind of push myself out of my comfort zone. So I am being very cautious where I'm putting it. Again, only putting it where I know I want it to be bright white. I can always go in and add more over the other layers of watercolor I'm doing. You can buy wax resist sticks from Amazon, Hobby Lobby, um, Dick Blick. Um, there's several brands. You just want to look for colorless wax. Um, the nice thing is there's no dry time with it. So once I got done putting the wax resist down wherever I wanted it, I jumped into color mixing. So I am mixing up my blue shade for the background. I'm dipping into some ultramarine blue and I am just getting that mixed up and ready to go. One tip, if your paintbrush holds a lot of paint and water, don't be afraid to kind of rub it on the side of your palette to get the excess out of your brush before you rinse it out. That way you're not wasting excess paint. I then took my paintbrush and filled it up with water so now I can get the paper wet so that we can do a wet into wet wash. Since the, my paintbrush was already blue and I'm going to be painting a blue sky, I didn't stress too much about making sure my paintbrush was perfectly clean clean when I was doing this. But if you are going to be doing a wet into wet wash like this and you're pre-wetting your paper and it is a different color than what you've been mixing, um, make sure you clean your brush really, really well. Um, that way your paints don't get tinted to the wrong color. But again, I'm just making sure this paper is really saturated. Um, that way I have more working time for these wet and wet washes. I'm using Strathmore 400 paper for this. So it's kind of a middle of the road paper. It's a wood pulp, wood pulp based paper and it is all right. It is not overly expensive so I can experiment with it and play with it and push myself without fear of wasting a supply but um, it doesn't hold the moisture as well as say a cotton paper like Arches or Canson Heritage paper. And so my working, so that causes my working time to be a little bit shorter. So I make sure I really saturate the paper. Sometimes I'll even saturate the paper, mix my color and then go pre-wet it again. Um, that way I can just make sure it's really wet and it's not going to dry overly quick. This tutorial I'm also doing in real time, so you might notice that it's quite a bit longer than the 15 minute ones that I usually post, 15 to 30 minute ones, because I wanted you guys to get a better feel for how long it takes to actually paint these and make it a little bit easier for you to follow along. So if you like this longer format, please let me know. Um, that way I know if this is the route I should go on more of my videos or if I should go back to the more sped up ones. So now I am taking my paintbrush and my paint and I am doing horizontal stripes across or strokes across the paper to fill in the sky. 
So I'm just kind of overlapping. The benefit of doing a wet and to wet on this is it, it's allowing the paint to spread. It's going to help it be a little bit more smooth when it's all dried out so you don't get quite as streaky of a, an effect. The reason why I'm going left to right on my brush strokes is just to create some consistency and to help differentiate the sky from the tree and the foreground that we're going to be painting. You don't want your brush strokes to all be the same. The direction you apply your paint can make a big difference in how our brain reads that color, whether it reads it as something growing vertically or if it's rough or smooth, all those things kind of play a factor into it. If you want something to look smooth and round, you want your brush strokes to follow the curve of that shape and you want your brush strokes to be very smooth, not much differentiate differentiation between this, those strokes. If you want something to look more rough and textured, you might go more vertically or kind of wavy in your strokes and have variation in color so that our brain reads that as rough. With this sky, I wanted it to just kind of fall into the background, not be the center of attention. The trees are our main focus. So I did a little bit of a gradient so that it's a little bit darker at the top. It fades out towards the bottom. I'm using a paper towel to kind of absorb any paint that has gone places I don't want it to be. And I'm just trying to get kind of a, a gradient slash flat wash with this. So no texture really. And I'm just kind of going back and forth on it. And remember, a lot of these techniques take time to learn. You, you're going to see me do it and you'll be like, why wasn't it, it as easy for me to do this as it was for her? Well, I might have more experience on it. And I've, I still have artists that I watch do things and I'm like, I don't know how they can get their brush to behave that way. Um, but I know it's a practicing and an experiencing and I'm just continuing to work on that. I wanted um, a little bit more of a gradient towards the bottom, so I used a little bit of a paper towel to kind of fade out the base of that. In the reference photo, it looks almost like there might be a little bit of a cloud towards the bottom, so I just kind of faded that color a little bit. And then I'm just continuing to go kind of back and forth, just tweaking it as it's still wet. Once this starts drying and it becomes more uneven in dryness I want to just leave it alone if you have damp paper and you are applying a lot of wet paint to it to like one area of it it can really make it kind of splotchy so you kind of have to work fairly quickly and you want your paper to stay the same wetness as you are doing this process once I got the sky to a point where I really liked where it was at, I let it dry completely. It's really important, especially with watercolor, to let your layers dry completely in between them. So, especially if they're gonna be right next to each other and touching. So I let that sky completely dry. The paper was no longer cool to the touch before I started in on these trees. So now I am mixing kind of a blue for our tree color. So I've mixed a little bit of ultramarine blue, a little bit of sap green. I'm trying to make kind of a blue foresty green color for the base of our trees. This is a pretty monochromatic painting. So we're at slash analogous painting. So it's not completely blue, but it's very blue heavy. And we're only pulling in a few other colors into it. So I have a pretty diluted out blue green mixture and I'm starting to block in some of those shadow areas on the tree. I'm using a smaller brush for this so I have a little bit more control and I'm just taking my time blocking in where those shadows are going to be sitting. Um, this is where it's really helpful to have the reference picture um, and the drawing guide kind of side by side when you're working so you can kind of see your placement. 
with these being more of organic shapes, it's easy to kind of lose your place in where it's supposed to sit. But I am just keeping in mind that the snow sits on top of the branches, so everything under the branch is going to be the color of the tree. So when I'm kind of visualizing it, I'm looking for like where those piles of snow would be sitting and then adding those shadows underneath those piles of snow, if that makes sense. Um, these brush strokes are kind of, they're kind of layered on top of each other, but they're just kind of little dashes and I'm kind of flaring them from the center outward. So they kind of lean more towards the left, the further left I go, and they lean more towards the right, the further right I go, um, just so that I can keep kind of that shape of the pine tree. I don't want to go completely horizontal or completely vertical on it. One of the best things that helped me with painting was really looking at the directions things were in my reference photo and then mimicking that in my painting. So looking at the direction fur grew on the nose of a dog as it kind of curved around versus when it kind of met the face of the dog and kind of looking at how that hair grew and the direction and mimicking that in my painting made a huge difference on how realistic the dog looked, the detail, how dimensional, all of those different things. And it's the same with our botanical paintings or our landscape paintings. Look at the direction things are growing in and that will help it look more realistic and help you get the look you're wanting to achieve. Now you can notice that I am starting quite a bit lighter in this area than what it's going to end up looking like. That's because I'm a little bit of a timid painter, especially with watercolor. I tend to work light to dark with watercolor and I always err on the side of it being lighter than what I want it to end up being because I can always go back and make it darker, but with watercolor, it's hard to make things lighter once you add a lot of pigment to your paper, especially if you start working with staining colors. You, it's part of the challenge of working with watercolor. So I tend to be a little bit more cautious in nature when I'm working with it and just apply a lot of layers. If you feel confident in your ability to judge your values and do it correctly, go ahead and start a little bit darker than me. Um, it's just kind of personal preference. I tend to think of Shrek where they talk about how he's like an onion and he's got layers. I think of that every time I paint. I paint like like an ogre with lots of layers. Um, it's probably why I like cooking with onions. <laughs> it's just the way I am. Um, another thing to remember also is watercolor tends to dry a few shades lighter than what it looks like wet. Um, when it's wet, the light reflecting in the water may, can make it appear a little bit darker than what it will dry like. It's similar to how acrylic paints tend to dry a little bit darker. Um, um, oil paints tend to stay true to color when they dry versus when they're wet. Granted, they take forever to dry. <laughs> Watercolor tends to dry a little bit lighter. And gouache is the real trick because some colors dry darker and some colors dry lighter. So that's part of just learning your paints and your supplies and how to um, work with them and get to know them. Because even how colors react and respond and mix um, can depend um, on the brand. So just something to keep in mind. I mixed up some more of our blue green paint. This one has a mixture of ultramarine blue, our sap green. I added a little bit of phthalo green to darken it up. And then I added a little bit of quidacridone red, or you could use a lizard crimson, um, just to help neutralize some of that green. So it wasn't super, super vibrant. Red and green are opposite colors. So when they mix, they kind of neutralize each other so they can turn a little bit brown and a little bit gray. So if you have a color that's too vibrant, 
and you don't want to like pale it out by using like white or gray it with black you can use the opposite color to just help you get more color variety out of your paints so I did that to darken it up I also didn't use as much water um, when you're using watercolors think of your water as your white so if you are having too anemic of colors or they're not saturated enough you need to use less water and have a higher concentration of pigment in your mix or paint if your colors are too strong like you like the color but it just needs to lighten up in value a little bit because it's too strong of a color you can just add a little bit of water to it so i'm just going over some of those areas that i've already painted um, also by blocking in these colors i kind of verified that's where i wanted them to be um, because if I, I didn't like where some of those shadows were, I could just leave it and act, use it as like a shadow on the snow and I could still have time to tweak or adjust my painting. But if I went in straight with these really dark colors, it just makes it a little bit more complicated. So that was kind of my rough sketch and now I'm filling it in with these darker, more saturated colors and we're starting to get more depth to our painting. And feel free if you feel like you need to switch to a smaller brush or a different brush because it gives you more control, go ahead for it. Go ahead. Don't feel like you have to use the same kind of brush as I am. Um, you use whatever you need to use to help you achieve what you want. I'm not a big rule follower. <laughs> um, whatever helps you get the job done in a way that makes sense for you and is comfortable for you. I say go for it. The brushes I am using are called Transon brushes, T-R-A-N-S-O-N. They are purchased from Amazon. And to give you the quick rundown, I really, really like them. Um, I do a full review on them here. Um, so you can watch the whole demo and full review and get all of the details on them but I really like them. They're very generous in their sizing. Um, so you get nice big brushes with fine points and they hold a lot of paint and water, which makes them um, more easy for me to use because I'm not having to dip my brush in and out of the paint as quickly, um, especially like when I'm doing wet into wet washes on a big area. So just something to know. You guys might be sick of my voice at the end of this video because it's so long, but I'm just continuing on with that same process. I am making my brush strokes smaller as I work towards the top of the tree. Um, if you look at a pine tree or any evergreen tree, the branches get smaller and more petite towards the top because that's where those new, new growth points are. They're also further away visually because they're taller than us. So just something to keep in mind that we should kind of do those lines a little bit smaller, a little more detailed, that kind of stuff. Um, something else is you want to have gaps in your trees where some of the sky pokes through. Um, if you make it too full and symmetrical and even, it might end up looking more like a, like a cartoon tree or a triangle instead of a natural organic tree in nature. So I'm just mixing up more of that same dark green blue color that has the sap green, phthalo green, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of our quadacridone red to help neutralize the color. That way I can make this color um, for our second tree. Um, just, just so you know what's going on. And now I'm starting the process again on our second tree, starting to get those little brush strokes in to help imply our branches. Sometimes I will use two brushes, um, especially if the color is a little bit darker than what I would like it to be. So I'll use one smaller brush to apply the color and then I might take a damp paintbrush and kind of just go over those areas that I've added the paint to and soften them up and kind of help push that paint around. Um, that's 
how I work. Sometimes I can have like five or six paintbrushes in my hands and I'm like swapping through them. <laughs> you just don't always see it on camera. Um, especially like when I'm in painting zone and I'm not thinking about teaching that painting or the process. I'm just listening to music or a book and I'm just zoned out painting. Um, I'll like look down and there'll be like five or six paintbrushes in my hands, one in my ear, um, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff going on. I always love it when I get in that painting zone. So again, just filling in um, our basic branches. You can see that just even with the contrast between the white snow and the sky, and then adding just those two um, layers of green to our tree, we're already starting to get the, the tree to show up and having it look dimensional. We still have a long way to go from where we want it to be, but this is always an exciting stage where you're seeing it start to come together. Um, you can lean your colors a little bit more of a warm green if you would like. Um, I just tended to um, lean more towards that like almost blue spruce, very blue toned greens for this picture, trying to keep it a little bit more monochromatic. Um, but you can kind of tweak the colors however you would like. This is even something um, you could paint it like this and then try painting it with more of sunset colors. Um, you would have to add some of those pinks or whatever you've added to your sunset or sunrise into the snow because your snow reflects those colors. Um, but I think that would be a really fun experiment to try. So now I'm taking a damp paintbrush that still has a little bit of residual blue paint in it. Not a ton, I've rinsed out most of it. And I'm just kind of going over some of those edges where the green of the branches meets the snow on the trees. Um, just to help build some of the shadow on that snow area because the snow will have shadows as well. So we're just gently going over that to start to build up some of that detail and depth within the painting. So my camera cut out for this foreground section, um, but this bottom kind of uh, left corner that's kind of triangular shape, I pre-wet that and I'm just taking some of that blue color. I added a little bit more ultramarine to it, so it's not quite as green based. And I just started blocking in where I want some of those shadows on the section to be. Just looking at my reference photo, um, I'm having these brush strokes again go left to right to help separate them from the tree. It will help also look like those trees are kind of growing over the edge of where we're standing. So it looks like kind of we're standing on the road and the trees are growing up from the hillside next to it. So I just blocked that in. I took a paper a towel, um, not a paper towel. I, I've kind of moved away from using paper towels as much and have just tried to use old rags so that it's a little bit more sustainable and I'm not generating as much waste in my office space. Um, but I just use that to absorb any paint that got too dark where I didn't want it to be. So now I've mixed up a green, uh, a stronger green color, and it is a mixture of sap green, thalo green, and then our Kodakridone red to just help neutralize it just a little bit. Our thalo green is very blue based, so it's kind of helping keep in that more cool tone of what we want this paper or this picture to have. And I'm taking a small paintbrush and I am going over some of that detail in those shadows. You can see that I'm not covering everything we painted. It's not covering everything that we've done before. I've just started to build up more layers to start getting more branch detail. And then I'm taking a damp paintbrush and kind of going back over it. As we build these layers, you don't have to cover everything that you've done previously. Um, by building up the layers and having a little bit of other layers peeking through so you can see some more of these blue tones or whatever it is, it allows a little bit more depth to be created because there's variation in value and texture and color and it just helps the picture 
be a little bit more interesting, at least for me. I like to see how artists work. And so sometimes I like to like look at all those different layers and think about how they went about doing that piece. Sometimes I think the biggest trick with painting is just learning to know how much paint to mix. Um, I know it's one of the biggest challenges for my art students. Sometimes they mix up way too much of a color. I'm just trying to get that right color. Um, and other times they don't mix enough and then they have to stop in the middle and remix. And that's something that can come um, with practice. But sometimes you just don't really know what you're going to be using that color for completely. You know you need it for a few spots, but then you like it and you're like, oh, I'll just add some more of that here and here and here. And all of a sudden you don't have more. So I mixed up more of our dark green color. And again, just filling in more of our tree. So in watercolor, there's several different techniques that utilize the wetness of your paint and the wetness of your paper in various combos. So our first technique was wet into wet. So very wet paper, and then you apply very wet paint to it. And this gives you a really soft blend. It also allows your paints to flow wherever the paper is wet. So you don't have as much control as what most painters would like. But it's also what gives you that watercolor effect. It's part of what makes watercolor watercolor. Um, the technique we're using now is called wet on dry. So you are applying wet paint onto dry paper. This gives you the most control. This is a great technique to use towards the end of your painting when you're trying to get details. You're not going to be doing tons of wet layers over the top and you want your paint to go exactly where you put it. You don't want it flowing off into other areas. So this is a nice stage of a painting to be because you can stop your painting at any point and then come back to it later. Whereas in those early stages when you're doing a lot of wet into wet or dry into wet, all those different layers, when you're really trying to utilize your wet paper, you can't stop. Once you start that side of your painting, you have to just stick with it and commit to it. And then you can answer the phone when you're done and letting your paper dry. So you kind of have this like hurry to wait situation. So you're hurrying and painting that and then you have to wait for your paper to dry. And if you're using cotton paper, sometimes it can be a long time. So it's kind of this back and forth thing. But just finish, finishing up that um, dark green layer on our pine trees. And then we'll start on to the next step. So once our paper dried completely, I came in with the wax resist crayon again, and I am just adding it wherever I want colors to stay the same. I'm mostly focusing it on the white and very light blue areas that are kind of shaded on the, the snow areas um, that I don't want to risk getting too dark as I build up more layers. Um, this is also a nice stopped, uh, stage to do it because the shape of the snow and some of those things are a little bit more refined than it was on our first go. And I'm sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. Uh, she is my permanent studio companion. And so she, she feels like she needs to help me paint or record voiceovers whenever possible. But I'm just applying this. I'm trying not to be too heavy handed because I want to be able to tweak and adjust things. And if I apply too much wax, um, to this paper, wherever I add the wax, I can't darken it. It is permanently stuck as is. So if you think you might want to tweak and adjust a certain area, don't put wax there. So again, just be cautious with it. Now I'm going to start mixing up some more colors. So this time I'm dipping into our phthalo blue and I'm adding it to our green. I added a little bit of our ultramarine blue to it as well. Phthalo blue is our green base blue. And then I am taking some of our sap green so that I can mix up kind of another variation of our blue green colors that we've been working with. The more you um, get used to color mixing and stuff, 
you'll start getting really um, fussy about colors. Um, I note I notice I notice variation of colors and those subtle differences a lot more than say my husband does because my job means that I am paying attention to value and color and hue and tints and shades and all of those different aspects to color and so the more you do this the more you'll really start picking up those subtle differences but if you feel like we are living deja vu where I mixed up a dark blue green color and I am adding more shadows <laughs> to the green of the trees you would be correct um it's part of the insanity of painting is just sometimes just going over and over and over layers to get those subtle tweaks and changes to get your painting the way you like it. So I'm just going in and adding some more of our dark shadow colors. Now notice I am not covering all of it. You can see slight color variations between it because we want there to look like there's deep shadows within. So there's a little bit of depth in the tree. We want it to look like there's maybe some snow and shadow on some of those areas. We want to create a little bit of variation of color. And, but we also want to have the full value spectrum within our painting. So that um, we can get that depth. Um, value plays a huge role in how realistic our paintings can look. And dimensional. And so value is how light or dark something is. So the lightest value you can have is pure white and the darkest value you can have is pure black. Together, they create high contrast, so just black and white. Um, but everything in between those colors is our value scale. So with this painting, I want to create a full value scale. And one thing that helps me know what to do on a painting if I'm feeling a little stuck is I will take a photo of what I'm working on and I will desaturate it in the editing part of my phone so that I can just get the grayscale of that picture. Um, sometimes I even have to put my reference photo in grayscale and compare them that way. That way I'm not distracted by color and I can just focus on value and see, oh, this area is too light. These two areas are kind of blending in and not really separating enough. So I need to make something darker to help push that back. Also, if you're using straight black and you um, can't, it's not dark enough, it might mean you need to lighten up the values around it. The same with white. If you're using pure white paint and your that highlight isn't bright enough or standing out enough, you might need to subtly darken the things around it so that bright highlight will stand out because value is also relative to the other values around it. So if you need to create more contrast, you might need to darken up something or lighten something up depending on what you're trying to achieve. And so right now in this painting, I am just helping build up some more of that contrast within the painting so that it looks a little bit more dimensional. So something to keep in mind when you are following tutorials, whether it's mine or someone else's, um, there's a million ways to paint things and there's a million ways to use your watercolor paints. So don't be afraid to try other people's styles and approaches. Um, there's some artists that I followed their tutorials and what I've learned from them has been mind blowing. Um, the information I've been able to learn from it and then extrapolate from that and apply to other areas of my painting has really kind of changed my life. Um, it's allowed me to become an artist um, professionally. Um, that said, sometimes I follow things and I try people's techniques and it just doesn't work for how my brain processes pigment and information and, and my hand control and all those different things. So experiment, push yourself outside your comfort zone and kind of try new things. But if something isn't quite working for you, don't be afraid to try a different approach. 
So now I am taking kind of some of our blue green colors and I am blocking in some stronger shadows on our foreground. So on that snowy bank next to the trees, I'm just adding a little bit stronger of a shadow. This, I use a little bit of watered down ultramarine blue on this section just to start building up some of those shadows. I even pulled in a little bit of Payne's Gray just to help gray it up just a little bit to add, and to add a little bit more depth. And you can see how I'm pulling it kind of left to right or more right to left and pulling it outwards from the right hand side to the left. And that's going to just help, help it look more like a shadow. And then I'm just adding a few imperfections so it looks a little bit more like there's maybe some snow tracks or some tracks in the snow, imperfections in it, that kind of thing. Then in our reference photo, there was like a distant mountain range behind the trees. So like you're looking across the valley and you're seeing these distant trees. So I am painting kind of a, a very grayed out blue-green mountain pass. Um, just roughly, um, it's not something that we have to add a lot of detail in because it is not the focus of the picture. It's just there to add a little bit of depth. But I painted it in and then I took my rag and I just kind of dabbed up some of it so it looks a little bit variated. Um, there's some light spots in it so it looks like there's some snow on it, that kind of thing. But it just kind of changes up the texture so it doesn't meld into the foreground too much. So I am continuing to work and kind of tweak and adjust this foreground, picking up a little bit more Payne's Gray so that I can add some stronger shadows right where that bank kind of touches those trees where the shadow's strongest. Taking clean damp paintbrush and kind of pulling it towards the left to help soften up some of those lines, creating a little bit of texture by having it not be like perfectly smooth. And you might be looking at this painting and being like, man, we're almost done. Why is there still almost 20 minutes of a tutorial left? Um, that's because I found that the last, you know, 10 to 20% of the painting can take just as long as the first 80 to 90% because once you are focusing on the details, you move a little bit more slowly. You're looking at your reference picture more and more going back and forth. Um, sometimes you paint a little bit, take a step back from your painting to see how it's looking. Um, maybe you take a lunch break and come back to it with fresh eyes. This last bit takes the most time, but putting in that time can really help def differentiate your work from everyone else's. I know um, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I just don't want to overwork my painting. Well, what does overwork mean? Most people aren't overworking their painting. Um, especially if they're working with acrylics and things like that, because you can always blank slate it, start over, or repaint a whole area and cover everything you've done. With watercolor, you can overwork it. I tend to think of overworking in watercolor as you have damaged the paper and it starts to peel where you get those little balls of paper on it. So overworking it means being too aggressive with your paper and it's kind of breaking down um, you have kind of reactivated layers of paint underneath it and it's kind of turned into a muddy mess. Um, that can be overworking, um, especially because watercolor, it's a little trickier to fix mistakes like that. But typically what people are referring to isn't overworking. Um, they are just afraid to make it look worse. But most of the time, if you are working in um, small layers and just subtle changes in your values and things like that and you're letting your layers dry in between each one you're not really going to overwork things and by pushing your detail level and then how many details you're adding to your painting all those kinds of things you're really going to help yourself learn how to paint more realistically now painting realistically may not be your end goal or even the style you want to achieve. Um, I don't always paint super realistically. 
but once in a while pushing myself to see how realistic I can make it, how dimensional all those things can be really helpful um, with my next painting, even if it's very different. Um, because you're building your observation skills, you're building your hand-eye coordination, you're developing your your pacing in when to transition from like blocking in to adding your details. Because um, you don't want to start adding details at the very beginning of your painting. You just don't because you're going to be covering over it. So helping you understand kind of your order of operations when painting all of those things come from pushing your skill level and seeing how far you can take it. So just something to keep in mind. So I have been working on the snow of on these trees and building up the shadows. So when you're looking at this picture, the sun is coming from and shining on the opposite side of the trees that we can see. And that's why we have the cast shadow on the snow banks or, um, in front of them. Okay. That means the outer edges of those trees will have a little bit more sun on them. They won't be quite as shadowy because the sun is hitting them more. But as we move towards the center of those trees closer to the trunk, it's going to be a little bit more in shadow. And the reason why I'm using blue for those shadow colors is kind of twofold. Naturally, our brains read blue as a cool shadow tone. Um, things that are further away tend to appear more blue and gray, right? That creates more distance. Um, blues tend to recede visually while warm tones like reds and oranges kind of tend to come forward visually on our paper. The other aspect to this is the color scheme of our painting. So we are painting snow, which is a very reflective color. It tends to take on the colors around it. And we are painting a bright blue sky. So we have a blue kind of reflected all over. And so I am using that blue within those shadows to help our snow have dimension. That said, I am making sure that the shadows in the snow areas don't compete too strongly with the more shadowed areas on our branches, right? We want to have that gradation in value um, or variation. And I don't want the snow to read as black because it's really hard for snow to look black, right? Because it's just naturally so reflective. So I'm keeping in mind those values and keeping the snow shadows still lighter than the darkest shadows on the tree. Speaking of darkest shadows on the tree, I am mixing almost a black color. It's a mix of our Payne's gray, which is a blue black color and some phthalo blue. And I am starting to very carefully add in our darkest shadows on this painting. So I'm using a small brush and I am taking my time with it. I'm not wanting to overdo this. I'm just adding just a little bit of these dark shadows to just help get that really strong contrast and pop to the picture. And you'll see me go back and forth in the next few minutes of adding shadow blue tones to the snow to darken some of those shadows up and darkening up a few areas on like the branches of the tree. So I'm going to be going back and forth quite a bit and really refining that detail and those values to get it to where I want. Again, I tend to work a little bit more slowly on some of these things. Um, I take a lunch break and then I come back to it and I look at my painting with fresh eyes. So don't be afraid to, to feel like you're done or you're kind of stuck and you don't know what to do next. Take a break, come back to your picture with fresh eyes and then you can kind of see what needs to be tweaked or adjusted. And this video is one of many videos that I have created here on YouTube um, about watercolor and demos that I've painted. Some of them are lo more long format like this. Others are a little bit more condensed, um, so they don't take quite as long to get through. Um, I have created a whole playlist um, dedicated to that. So if you would like to 
check those out and learn more about watercoloring and seeing the different things that I've painted with watercolor and learn various different techniques with it, um, I would recommend checking that out. So I'm just continuing to just refine those details. Sometimes I will lean my picture up against a wall or my easel and then step away from it and look at it from a distance. That is another way to help you kind of see what your picture might need or areas that it might need to be adjusted. Because if some of those details kind of fade into each other when you're looking at it from a distance and they're not supposed to fade into each other, then you might need to up the contrast. If they are supposed to kind of recede visually and be more of like a background and they're not supposed to compete for the center of attention in your painting, you might need to make them a little bit more blurry so they're not as in focus because that's a way to help things recede visually. You might need to soften up the colors because things tend to um, be lighter in value and be a little bit more gray um, when they're in the distance. So that's one way to kind of help. Um, and then also just adjusting your contrast. So if you want some areas to kind of fall back visually and and not be the center of attention, you might need to soften how much contrast they have um, in ratio to like your main focus of the painting. So just kind of keep some of those factors in mind as you are doing your finishing touches on your piece. I really, really enjoyed doing this painting. I love winter. Like I'm, I'm more of a spring and fall girl. Like those are my favorite seasons because I love, love, love flowers and the autumn, I love the color change, and it makes me think of growing up on um, and next to a bunch of fruit farms. Uh, my grandma ran a fruit farm, and so when I when the autumn is in the air, it just makes me think of picking apples, um, peaches, all that kind of stuff, and working on the farm with her. But I really enjoy winter. Um, winter was uh, one of the seasons that I played a lot. Um, whether it was snowboarding or cross-country skiing or snowshoeing, all those types of things. I tend to have a lot of fun in the winter, and that's probably why I don't mind it. Um, I struggle more when it's like super duper hot. Um, I, I, I'm very fair skinned, and all my ancestors came from like Arctic countries, um, and frozen tundras and so I don't know if I'm genetically predispositioned to like snow more than super hot temperatures but that's just the way I am um, but what about you do you like snow activities do you struggle with snow and cold weather or are you a sunshine person and what it's like what is it like um, in your area and where you're from so we are almost done and just in editing this video, I could tell I was almost done because there'd be like five, 10, 15 minutes of footage of just my hand holding still or kind of like twitching back and forth because I was staring at the painting, seeing what I needed to adjust. So I cut that out. Um, and now I'm just going in and just refining those last few details. I love pine trees because if you kind of get the it too thick at the top of the pine tree you can always extend it up just a tiny bit to help get that nice taper and those like dainty branches at the very top and now I'm just going in and just refining some of those shadows one thing I noticed when I was kind of sitting there staring at the painting is that the tree was still looking a little flat like there's depth within the tree but it didn't look as round or cone shaped as what I was wanting it to be so I needed to add a little bit more shadow to the snow um, along the base where the pine tree meets, the base of the pine tree meets kind of the, the hillside. And then I needed to make the snow on the branches kind of in the middle of the tree where the tree would be in more of a shadow and not get very much of the sun hitting it. I needed to darken those sections up so that it gives the illusion that our our pine tree is more rounded or cone shaped so i'm taking a very diluted ultramarine blue 
again, very, very diluted. It's more water than paint. And I am just concentrating it in the center of that tree. And I'm starting it out where those shadows are, like where the branches are, and just pulling it down into those snow snowy sections, if that makes sense. I'm also adding it where the two trees kind of overlap because that part of the tree would also have a little bit more shadow in it. And shadows make such a big difference on the depth and the shape of an object that we are painting. So I'm just refining those last two details. I am using a very soft touch with my paintbrush. So I'm not like scrubbing or pressing really hard because I don't want to activate the paints that I've already laid down. That's also why you wait for it to dry between layers. So your risk of activating paints is greatly reduced. But I finished the painting and I was happy with it. So I signed it with my Micron pen and now my favorite, favorite part of any painting process, removing the tape and getting that nice border, except for where some of that paint bled through. But there's just something about this process that is like so satisfying to me as an artist. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you found it helpful. Um, when you're trying to learn how to paint snowy landscapes um, or snow covered trees. And if you like it, please hit the like button. If you have any questions, leave them down below for me. And if you want to see more of what I create, please follow along. And so you guys can see all the things that I post so that we can improve in art together. Have a great day and I'll see you next time. Bye.